Are you struggling to find the perfect Father's Day gift? Well, look no further because today's video sponsor is Ridge and they've got you covered with their Father's Day sale. And let me tell you, Ridge products are game changers. This wallet can hold up to 12 cards, which does seem excessive. I think I have three in here. A couple of bank cards and my ID. <laughs> But if you got 12, it's got you covered. Plus there's a little cash thing on the back. So if you still use cash, as you can see, I have a little on there at the moment. That's perfectly squeezed in like that. Plus it's designed with RFID blocking materials to protect your personal information. And also there's the key case, which is the perfect solution for all of those jangling keys in your or your dad's pocket. It's like a Swiss army knife for keys. And these are my office keys. Top lock, oh, well, outside, no, outside, top lock, bottom lock, and then the, the post box. So easy. Look, you've probably given a bad Father's Day gift in the past. I'm now a father and I'm expecting many years of bad gifts, but what wouldn't be a bad gift, what indeed would be a fantastic gift, is the Ridge Wallet. Say goodbye to the old bulky wallet and switch to a Ridge. They've got 50,000 five-star reviews and a lifetime warranty so you know that you're getting a quality product. Plus, They've got a huge sale right now. You can save up to 40% by using my unique link through June the 10th. So don't miss out on this amazing deal. Head to ridge.com slash shadows and find the perfect Father's Day gift for your dad. And don't forget, ridge.com slash shadows. And now today's video. It was a beautiful summer evening for a jog in the woods. Just before dusk on June the 2nd, 2009, along the trails of the Toranic Falls State Park, just outside the city limits of Ithaca, New York, a pair of young newlyweds headed out for a sunset run. Blase Cot, 24, and Catherine Coffey, 28, were enjoying the forest path located just 350 meters from their shared apartment on the rural outskirts of town. It was just after 8 p.m. He had just finished helping her upload their wedding pictures to Facebook. The happy pair were married exactly one month to the day after a small celebration with friends and family in Costa Rica. Blase had moved to America from New Zealand. Carolyn was from Ireland and they'd met through their studies and work at Cornell University. She was a postdoctoral researcher in veterinary science and he was studying for his PhD in computer science. By all accounts, they were a lovely, promising and intelligent young couple just starting their lives together in America. What Carolyn didn't know was that Blase was not planning on returning home with her after that jog. In fact, he no longer even thought of her as his wife. As they paced along the path together, he was planning to destroy the imposter, pretending to be the woman he loved. Cot claimed that he'd been convinced in the weeks following their nuptials that the woman beside him was no longer Carolyn. She had been replaced with an identical double, like something out of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Someone or something, had managed to look like her, talk like her, and perfectly impersonate his wife, but it wasn't her. Overwhelmed with paranoia and fear that he was being manipulated by an imposter, Cot stopped their jog just a few minutes from their front door to brutally beat his wife with a metal pipe and slit her throat. He left her to bleed out and die on the trail. She'd be discovered by another jogger on the path the following day, lying face up in a white t-shirt, drenched in blood from wounds from the pipe, and a small yellow utility knife. Blase returned home right after the murder. In a frenzied state, he burned his bloody clothing and set his apartment on fire. Within two hours of killing her, he was spotted by local police sitting in his car in that same park. The officer saw his arms covered with dried blood and approached the vehicle concerned. Cot took off, and after an eight-kilometer high-speed police chase, he crashed his car into some trees. The blood on his arm and parts of his face was from attempting to slash his own neck before he fled. He failed at both suicide attempts and was airlifted to hospital where he recovered before being moved to a detention facility. The events left the community and his peers at the university horrified, confused, and in shock. Cot's defense attorney, Joe Yock, explained in court what drove Cot to murder. A temporary insanity brought on by a disorder. An expert witness was called in to testify, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Rory Hortelin. Hortelin spent 16 plus hours interviewing and running tests on Cot, as, as well as doing interviews with his friends and family. The conclusion was that Cot suffered from schizotypal personality disorder, a pathological condition characterized by odd behavior, social isolation, paranoia, and a tendency to accept unconventional beliefs like conspiracy theories. This was something Cot had been struggling with for nearly a decade. The conviction that his wife had been replaced with an imposter, though, that was new. Cot clearly had a long history of issues, but up until the wedding, he seemed stable. 
During the trial, the defense explained the high-stress changes in his life were responsible for pushing him over the edge. His PhD research was rejected by Cornell, and that failure allegedly coincided with his newfound responsibilities as a married man driving him into madness. The expert also theorized that the anti-malaria medication had taken for his wedding in Costa Rica was the final nail in the coffin that altered his already rattled mental state. This combination proved deadly, and Cott succumbed to the delusion that his wife was no longer the same person that he married, a misidentification condition called Capgras syndrome. It was a strange case. The murderer was not even disputing what he did. He admitted to planning the stabbing for three days leading up to their last jog, but insisted that he firmly believed someone had replaced Carolyn with an identical imposter, and removing her was the only way to stop the paranoia, the spying, and the conspiracies. In the end, Cott was convicted by the jury, despite experts being brought in to explain what was happening inside his mind. He's currently serving a 25-year-to-life sentence in New York State's prison system. Capgras syndrome, or Capgras delusion, is a rare misidentification disorder most commonly reported in patients with schizophrenia or dementia or some other kind of neuropsychiatric condition. But it can also be occasionally triggered by seizures, drug use, or a traumatic brain injury. The syndrome was first described by French psychiatrist Joseph Capgras in 1923. He and his co-author, Jean Raboul Le Chau, wrote a paper on a 53-year-old woman. The patient was a paranoid megalomaniac who transformed everyone in her entourage, even those closest to her, such as her husband and daughter, into various and numerous doubles. The crucial and sole symptom that separates Capgras delusion from other delusions or neurological atrophy is the belief that people they know well and had prior intense emotional connections with have been replaced by identical doubles. People experiencing Capgras can recognize the physical appearance, voices, and even detailed memories of their loved ones, but they are convinced that they have been replaced with a fake. Their reasoning is the fallout of a desperate and broken logic. The undamaged parts of the brain trying to understand why the person that they used to associate with positive feelings and a solid emotional bond now elicits zero emotional response, like looking at a cardboard cutout of the person they once knew. How can they be looking directly into the eyes of someone that they used to love, but they're completely stripped of any and all emotion? This convinces most people experiencing Capgras that the only possible explanation for the lack of emotional response is that the subject has been replaced by a stranger. Why else would they feel nothing, lose all the warmth and comfort that they once held for this person? And since they intellectually know that the human standing before them looks like, sounds like, and knows all the information their loved one also knew, it has to be some sort of doppelganger, an android, a spy, an alien, or an elaborate authority conspiracy to betray them. Because Capgras is a rare condition, only 255 confirmed cases worldwide as of 2019, it isn't often covered in psychiatric journals or in the media unless a severe situation arises like COTS. The syndrome, so far, has been documented affecting women more than men, but violent reactions to the condition have been largely carried out by men. Now, despite the headlines and the case files, Capgras diagnostic criteria are not yet in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the profession's main diagnostic tool published by the American Psychiatric Association. In the United States, this is the guidebook for psychiatric diagnoses. Capgras comes down to a case of bad wiring. Due to the breakdown of fibers inside the brain, either from a degenerative mental condition, drug-induced interruption, or traumatic brain injury, visually represented information is no longer processed correctly. Memories, facts, faces, all of that remains lucid and real inside the brain, but the emotions are no longer assigned to what the patient sees. Now, when you look at an object, animal, person, anything that you can see, that visual information is sent from your eyes to your brain, specifically to the visual centers in your two temporal lobes. But seeing is not understanding. To complete a normal sequence, the brain instantly assigns the correct emotion to the subject that you're viewing, thanks to another part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala processes what you're seeing and relays the correct emotion so that you can react appropriately, such as hugging a close friend or running full speed from a grizzly bear. Eyes to temporal lobes to the amygdala. That is how your brain works out what it sees, and then it instructs you on how to correctly react to, well, keep you living. 
It is theorized that people with Capgras syndrome do not experience the same sequence in their brain. The research so far expounds that the nerve fibers that connect the temporal lobes to the amygdala are interrupted, broken, or disconnected somehow. A person suffering from Capgra can look at and see their mother. They can remember her face, recall her birthday dinner the night before, but that data never gets to the amygdala, and the correct emotional response is not relayed like it was before. They can visually comprehend their loved ones, but what used to be a comforting and familiar person is now devoid of all regularly associated feelings, which is a terrifying experience to suddenly have. The struggling brain tries to make sense of this and often grasps for the same straw, that the person just must be an imposter. Experts have not yet confirmed what conditions create Capgras syndrome. The research so far reports that the broken connection of the fiber network is the most probable cause. In theory, it would also affect the subject's emotional responses to other objects and strangers. But few of us assign much weight in our emotional responses to things like mailboxes, a taxi driver, or the neighbor's dog, which is why Capgras only seems to trigger when the once warm feelings for a beloved family member or friend are gone. In case studies where Capgra drove his victim to violent acts or the desire to commit violent acts, almost all of those studied had a long and complex list of mental illnesses associated with past trauma. For example, if a retired soldier is already dealing with several neurological disorders as well as PTSD from his time in the military, that could be the recipe that starts to tear apart the sections of the brain that process vital information. In one cab car case involving a 24-year-old male veteran who had several mental health conditions such as major depressive disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, adjustment disorder, and borderline personality disorder, as well as a recent car accident but no history of brain trauma, he recounted what he was experiencing, but his words were scattered and confused. He was having issues understanding and believing time and dates. Per an interview with a subject where he disclosed he no longer believed his mother was real, quote, Last year, my sister told me it was not 2016, but it was 2022. She told me that I have hurt my mother with a padlock, that you could no longer identify her face. I don't remember having done this. I have lived with her since that time, so I don't think it's really my mother. The quote ends. He thought his mother had been replaced by government employees who were following him to drag confession out of him for his behavior while serving in the military. And while he expressed guilt over actions he performed while serving, such as punching a wall at boot camp and napping during his assigned duties, his own mother claimed he never attacked her with a padlock. In other violent cases attributed to Capgra, a history of severe depression could also be a foundational condition that introduces this lack of visual processing. In one case, a patricide, a middle-aged man suffering from 20 years of bipolar disorder, developed Capgra in middle age. Despite his mental state being reported as good for several years, he still declined steadily into the belief that his father had been replaced with a double. The day before his murder, the father requested his son receive outpatient service at the Public Department of Mental Health. His son refused the treatment, no longer associating his paranoia with his history of mental illness, and instead fully grasping his new reality that his father was an imposter. The subsequent murder was so vicious, the forensic reports read darker than any crime drama. To quote, The murderer repeatedly stabbed his father with a bread knife, causing the abdominal lesions, including the fatal one. Thereafter, he violently banged his father's head against the baseboard, causing the blunt head trauma. In the last stage of the murder, the perpetrator pushed the sets of keys down inside the victim's throat in order to silence him. Quote ends. While Capgra is most often experienced by people already suffering from neurodegenerative diseases, there have been rare cases triggered by drug use. Seven cases have even been attributed to cannabis. While pot is a mild hallucinogen and comparatively benign compared to other substances, in some extremely rare cases, long-term use was enough to cause the syndrome. In one such case, a man without any history of mental illness was convinced his family and neighbors had been replaced. He had been aggressive with his family for three months prior and shared his fears about them being replaced by doubles. He was brought by the authorities to a psychiatric hospital after unsuccessfully trying to murder his neighbor. At the time he was being evaluated, he also had been experiencing anxiety, sleep deprivation, reduced appetite and neglect of personal hygiene and care. The journal Curious reported, During the mental examination, it was evidence that the patient believed their parents were killed some time ago and imposters were now replacing them. Therefore, his desire to murder the imposters. In that specific case, everything from HIV testing to MRI scans were performed to whittle down the cause to marijuana. The MRI was used to detect any structural lesions in the brain, which it didn't find. But the scan did discover a slight accentuation of cerebellar folia caused by the long history of cannabis use. 
He was prescribed antipsychotics and put under intense supervision, and the cab graph seemed to resolve itself in a month or two. A bit of good news in this terrifying reality of melting brain connections. Now, there are no specific treatments or cures for Capgras syndrome. The best science can do it this time is treat the underlying conditions with varying results, like in the case of the 28-year-old male in the cannabis example who had a rare and lucky recovery. Antipsychotic medication, therapy, close monitoring, and surgery for brain injuries are examples of what is already being used to deal with drug abuse, dementia, schizophrenia, and DBI. But when it comes to actually getting diagnosed with Capgras syndrome, you're treatable, but it's probably incurable.